One of the great advantages of doing this job as an academic in a university department is that I get to be all the parts in Shakespeare. Uh, so here am I doing a bit of Juliet, which you will recognize from last night. Gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds, towards Phoebus's lodging. Such a wagoner as Phaeton would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. Spread thy close curtain, love, performing night, that runaway eyes may wink and Romeo leap to these arms um, of mine unseen. Oh, I have bought the mansion of a love and not possessed it. And though I am sold, not yet enjoyed. So tedious is this day as is the night before some festival to an impatient child that hath new robes and may not wear them. That's Juliet, the married girl, married that morning. But this love of hers is not yet consummated, impatient, waiting for her Romeo to leap into each other's arms. Impatient because, of course, it's not happening. Hours are passing. The whole day has to be waited upon. So. How does Juliet use up this time between the morning of the marriage and the night of consummation? How does she use up this time? She talks. She consumes it in speech. And I want to analogize this to you because you are all sitting, waiting. You are all Juliet's. Waiting for results, who's going to be in the final? And I am the kind of antidote to your impatience, or maybe perhaps a focus of the tedium. Uh, and what I intend to do for the next 35 minutes or so is to waste this time with speech. But not insignificantly, I guess, uh, this occasion, the great Shakespeare debate, the final of the great Shakespeare debate, comes very near to the end of the university term. Um, my students have read uh, about 36 plays uh, across the year. They've attended 36 lectures. Some of you have gotten out of it today, haven't you? you <laughs> Some of them have been on holiday with you, missing Coriolanus, see me later in the study. Um, uh, listening to 36 uh, lectures on something like 20 plays or so uh, on the Shakespeare module at uh, Warwick University. And what I would say about all of those plays that have run from the Taming of the Shrew, to King Lear, to Hamlet, to Coriolanus, Troilus and Cressida, all of the plays of Shakespeare have something in common, and that is an urgency to speak, to say, to tell, to report. Say it, Othello. Our oldest born, speak first. Speak again, bright angel. My tongue will tell the anger of my heart. She speaks, and tis such sense that my sense breeds with it. Say on, come to Hecuba. Speak, Roman, speak. Even the tongue-tied, the mute, the speechless in Shakespeare express their dumbness, their stuttering in speech. And I want to use this short time that I have with you just to consider speech in Shakespeare and try a little bit to connect it with what you've been doing for the past couple of days. At its most basic, Shakespeare's plays, that is the play text that we have come down to, this, this, thing, this thing that we call, you know, the book. What is that book, the book of the play? Well, the book of the play is a collection of speeches. That's what Shakespeare writes as a playwright. He writes speeches. And then he writes a counter speech, and a counter speech to that. And the play builds up this texture, this sequence of speaking parts. Speech, of course, is what actors have, what Shakespeare gives them as the parts 
to the play. It's what they learn, what they memorize, what they deliver on the stage. Speech is what the playwright makes, it's what the actor performs. So these books of the play we might see as collections of speeches. And I'd just like you to cast your mind back over the last couple of days of the variety of speech acts you've encountered in these plays. Speeches that describe, think of what, speeches that reveal, that persuade, that discover, that protest, that accuse, seduce, hide, abuse, pray, wonder at things, account for things. Speeches that tell selves, that discover interiority. Soliloquy, you, you, will, you will have you know, a, a, a thought about, is a kind of little machine for knowing a mind, for knowing a heart, for thinking out loud and telling us what you're thinking about. So, speeches that tell selves. Speeches, significantly, that get things done. Speeches that invent things that never have been, never have happened, and that explore alternative or virtual realities. Worlds unknown happen in these speeches. Speeches that perform simulation exercises, permitting stand-ins, proxies, the place of the hypothetical. What if speech can do that on this stage? What if speeches that remember Speeches that create a kind of vast reservoir of human memory, a memory bank through these plays. I put it to you that speech as we know it was perhaps one of the greatest inventions of the early modern theater, and that Shakespeare was one of its greatest practitioners, the making of speech and the making of speech as we know it. So just run through the catalog of speech acts that you know from Romeo and Juliet, okay? That kind of male aggro on the, on the, on the street to begin with, that kind of rap uh, of, uh, of Verona, Verona lads rap on the street, put against the speech of authority when the prince comes in, put against the kind of adolescent self-indulgence of Romeo trading with Benvolio, all that stuff about Rosalind that is so dead in its metaphors of artificial beyond belief, set against the absolute freshness of the speech of a man seeing a girl across the crowded world room and saying, she doth teach the torches to burn brightly, set against the kind of lyric that those two young people put together in that first duet, put against the reportage, basically almost kind of journalistic, uh, uh, thinking that Romeo goes through in Mantua when he's uh, remembering that he saw somebody that looked as though he might be somebody who could sell him some poison, reporting on what it was that he was thinking and feeling um, at that time and how he might use that. Put against the astonishing nightmare speech of Juliet when she's trying to decide whether to drink this potion that the friar has given her. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is it going to do what he says? Maybe he's going to kill me. What should I, what will happen if I wait? What will happen if, what will happen if, what will happen if? And that speech that rises to this crescendo of terror and anxiety before she takes it and knocks it back. As against those speeches of the two emptied out families at the end, having dead children, no future, for those families and the only option to build statues in gold and maybe finally to end a feud that has cost them their children. 
So catalogs of speeches, of different kinds of speeches, of speeches that are doing and thinking and imagining and exalting and terrifying you. Shakespeare and Co, and I use that Shakespeare and Co advisedly for Stanley Wells, wherever he is uh, 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 today as part, he's usually here as part of this great Shakespeare debate. So he's another she, part of the palace. Is he yeah. another part of the palace? Shakespeare and Co. Um, Shakespeare and his, his uh, uh, um, uh, uh, playwrights who were working alongside, uh, alongside him in, in other uh, 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 companies and on the other stages. Uh, but those people had an attitude to speech. They understood that talking marks man off from other beasts. If we are all animals, what marks us as different is that we humans are talking animals. The great playwright Ben Jonson said that the only benefit man has to express his excellency of mind is language. And notice that verb, express. That means for Ben Johnson to push it out there, to get it out in front of other, other people. So the only benefit of man has to express his excellency of mind is language. Now that's an idea that Johnson had perhaps picked up um, in the grammar school. Uh, you went to the grammar school to learn how to speak, to speak Latin. But in learning to speak Latin, you also learned how to speak English. Uh, picked it up in the grammar school uh, from Cicero, from the classic writer Cicero, who wrote, it is in this alone, or in this especially, that we are superior to the animals, that we can converse amongst ourselves and express our thoughts in speech, that we can converse, that is that we literally go this way, in our lives, speaking to each other, making relationships, talking to each other, and making our thoughts known. In Shakespeare, to be languageless is to be a monster. Think of Caliban in The Tempest, pre-tutorial lessons uh, with Miranda. Somehow, if you don't have language, as it said about Caliban, you are not able to know your own meaning. Taught language, his, your purposes are endowed with words that make them known. Gaining language is to gain the knowledge of your purpose and be able to communicate that, to make yourself known. Those purposes in Caliban, of course, you will remember, ironically, uh, include learning how to curse. Uh, not all speech is going to be pretty or constructive or what we want to hear. But that's by the by. When we parents teach you children to speak, we're not necessarily going to be able to control all that you talk about it will come back, as Caliban does, to bite the tutor. But to lose speech, like Edgar in King Lear, who disguises himself as the Bedlam beggar, or Mowbray in Richard II, who, when he is exiled, realizes that he's never going to be able to speak English again. Sent abroad, he will lose his tongue. My tongue's used to me no more. Uh, and sees that as a kind of speechless death. That losing of speech is a kind of horror or erasure of self, loss of self. <coughs> Relatively, coming into speech is coming into being, coming somehow into focus, being really, really, really there and present. So, Johnson again, Language most shows a man. Speak that I may see thee. Not speak that I may hear thee, but speak that I may see thee. So language most shows a man, and when you speak, I can see who you are. It's only by their speaking that we know anyone in Shakespeare. Speech makes character, not character speech. 
Speech makes character, not character speech. Speech is anterior to character in Shakespeare. In Shakespeare and his contemporaries, you are what you speak. Now, my title, some of you will have realized um, from the off, speak what we feel, bracket, not. Uh, you'll recognize that as an interrupted quotation of Edgar at the end of King Lear. That play, and I hope you'll see it, the RAC is putting it back into the theater right now, so I hope you'll come back to Stratford uh, and see uh, this production of, of, uh, of King Lear uh, and to hear those speeches uh, in the theater. Um, because this play is perhaps Shakespeare's most comprehensive investigation of speech. It's a play that starts with an instruction to speak. The king, suddenly wanting to know something from his children, asks them to speak, his three daughters, and to tell love. Two of the daughters are able to do that speech making, but the third daughter cannot speak. She can't tell her love. Indeed, most monstrously, she imagines the idea of speaking love as trying to heave her heart into her mouth and says she cannot perform this weird anatomical disturbance. I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. So she says, nothing. Saying nothing, of course, is the trigger to people saying far too much. Cordelia, told to men to speak, to speak a little bit more, nothing will come of nothing, starts talking and says far more than a third daughter ever should say, especially to big sisters in the room. Uh, but then her father explodes and says more than he should say. This produces, in the same scene, people speaking out of turn. So Kent, in an act of monumental insubordination, speaks out against the king and tells the king what to think. The king tells him to shut up. Peace, Kent. And Kent won't shut up, so Kent is banished. That produces in Kent the need, if he's going as he aims to, to return to stand by his king for the rest of the play, to return disguised. And as part of that disguise, he disguises his voice. He puts on what he describes as raised accents and goes through the play speaking in the accents of somebody else. Over in the parallel plot, a brother denounces a brother, speaks against that brother, tells lies about that brother, turns his brother into a fugitive who, as part of his disguise, again, loses speech, loses language, puts on the disguise that is physical but is also oral of a bedlam beggar. And as bedlam beggar, what he speaks is wild nonsense, a grammar disturbed that somehow connects to King Lear's increasingly mad utterance, mad speaking, a grammar of the person that is utterly distorted. He goes out onto the heath, into a storm, into one of the most nearly apocalyptic scenes uh, that Shakespeare ever wrote. <coughs> and there are three of them who stand together. A king who's now a madman, a courtier who's now a bedlam beggar, and a fool, creating a chorus of human sound thrown against the big voice of that tempest. Finally, at the end, Lear is surrounded by dead daughters and comes back into the final scene without a voice, capable only of animal noise, of speech reduced simply to sound. Howl, 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 howl. howl. Edgar, kind of our last man standing in King Lear, a man clinging to the wreckage, looks at this array of dead families. His brother's dead, his father's dead, the king is dead, the three girls are dead. 
practically the single survivor, the single representative of the youth, the last speaker. And it's he who observes the weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. What does that mean? Speak what we feel as against what we ought to say. Is there a terrible irony in that or a paradox at the end of this play, looking back to the beginning of this play where people spoke what they felt? The play could have turned out so much differently if they had just confined themselves to what they ought to have said, or indeed what the king ought not to have said. But it's at that point that I turn this over to you to think about what you've been doing for the last couple of days, coming into the practice of speaking speaking different ways, speaking to different ends, speaking with different vocabularies than your normal ones that you use, speaking with different aims and intentions to persuade, oh, to win, yeah, to go for the juggler, to make the points and to win. But speaking and celebrating the idea of speaking, of calling yourselves into being through speaking. And what I'm hoping that this experience for you will partly have achieved is not just the honoring of the principle of speaking and the excitement of speaking, of flexing muscles in perhaps much more robust ways than you're permitted to do when you're texting or using those screens. Uh, but flexing bigger muscles that Shakespeare gives you the kind of reflexes uh, to, uh, to use, that you will be excited by speaking, that you'll get hooked on words and words and words and throwing about those words along with throwing around your brains, um, and that this will be a kind of induction, indoctrination, into the pleasures of this thing called speaking. And then the rest is silence. So thank you very much.